Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Gym Class Heroes podcast. How are you doing, Keeper? I'm I'm doing good. I'm recovering. I uh, I feel like I can get through things like long road trips really well, but I think because I'm so stubborn about powering through it, the back end of it really fucked me up a little bit, but but yeah. we're getting there. So to give the, the people some context, you just drove how many hours across the country? I think the drive is supposed to be 27 hours. Uh, we, and it's from Vegas to Cookville because Kyra's competing on the Mayhem team this season. So we're getting her down here. We drove with the dogs. Uh, we did it in three days. So it was like plus or minus nine hours each day. But by the time you stop, yeah. by the time we stopped, like let the dogs run around, they turn into 12 hour days every day. So much, wow. uh, much caffeine consumed over the, over the week. Yeah, that's a lot. But you have a while right before, like you won't make that drive, or you are making that drive again in a few weeks. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll be here for a couple of weeks with their with the team, and then I'll fly back to Vegas for a week just to check in with my crew. I'll come back down for a week, and then we're flying one of my buddies down, and he's gonna do the drive with me. So nice. I'll drive back in four or five weeks, so I get time to recover. That's good. Yeah, yeah. that's the worst when you do a long trip, and then you got to turn around too soon just, afterwards. Just wait till you do your drive to Vermont. <laughs> it's gonna be such a long drive. I promise that the back end of that is beautiful, though. Did I ever tell you my Texas story when I drove and moved from Texas to and like, Arizona? Yeah, it that uh, can't be that far. I well, I mean, it took two days, but I think okay. the the plan was like a nine hour day and then mm-hmm. like an eight ish hour day. Texas is big. Like, I think that when you look at it on a map, you're like, oh. Texas isn't that far from Arizona, but Texas yeah. is just gigantic. It takes like over an hour just to fly out of Texas if you're in Austin. Um, but the long and short of it is when I was driving back, my dad drove the U-Haul and one of my girlfriends flew out and drove in my car with me. Okay. And the there was a rollover with a semi and I guess somebody died and it was like a hazmat thing. And so we were stuck on the freeway, no exaggeration, from 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. the next morning. That's brutal. And we would drive like a couple feet and then stop. <laughs> and like an hour would go by and then we'd drive a little bit. So you couldn't like sleep because you did have to keep moving. But people were running out of gas. People were like, there's nowhere to go to the bathroom. I mean, people's, it was just crazy. It was yeah. hours and hours. I mean, that was like such a test of like, I have no control over the situation. Like, and it's the middle of Texas. So it's like, all weeds around you. It's not like, right. I don't know, in Arizona, there's a lot of places to pull off every so often and more civilization. This was like the middle of Texas. Um, but gosh, after doing that, I'm like, I think I'm just going to ship my stuff if I ever move across country. I don't know that I could risk ha- that happening again. It's funny because I grew up and lived pretty much my whole life in the Northeast. And so everything in the Northeast is like fairly similar. If I were to go anywhere else, I would always fly. And so over the last year, I've done a couple long road trips and I've been across yeah. the country. I'm like, oh, it seems silly to say, but it's like, oh, the world is different than I thought it was. <laughs> totally. totally. Yeah, it's a it's a different beast. And it, like that also made me I was already pretty minimal, but I feel like even now I'm even more so I'm like, I want to be able to get up and move if I needed to and have mm-hmm. very few things because <laughs> moving lots of things is such a pain. Yeah, but we're here. It's good. I got my ass kicked yesterday going on what I thought was like a, a nice casual Thursday outdoor bike ride with the team that was not casual at all. <laughs> and uh, and we live to see another day. Oh, I cut you cut out for a second. You said you did a Thursday casual bike ride and then what? Uh, a third. Oh, no, it was not a casual bike ride. I did what I thought was going to be a Thursday casual bike ride outside with the team. It was not casual at all. Um, but uh, but I survived barely and we lived to see another day. Nice. Yeah. Well, we did um, a little Q&A and pulled some questions, which are fun. We're going to have a Q&A episode coming up soon. But we also got a couple questions that were really good in terms of being able to do an episode and have a little conversation about that topic alone. Um, so we're going to pull a couple of those out for our next few episodes. Uh, why don't you expand? I think this was one you got on working with brands a little bit on the question that you got. Sure. Yeah. So somebody DM me after we asked the question, asked for questions. And I've gotten this a couple times from people. And the question was basically like, how do you build relationships with brands? Um, and I think it was partly asking me personally, because I've had really good relationships with Podium as well as LSKD and a couple other smaller brands. But I think just in general, this is somebody that's around the space, really invested in the space. Um, they are kind of an aspiring athlete. And so they're just trying to figure out both from 
sort of our end of things where we're more on the support side as well as an athlete side? Like how do people start to build relationships with brands? Is it just reaching out and DMing them? Is it people that you are fortunate enough to meet somewhere? And so I think there's a lot of different ways to go about it. And there's probably some ways not to go about it. So it's an interesting conversation for us to have. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, when you mentioned that question, I think my brain immediately went to like, oh, here's all the things that I don't think you should do, you know, yeah. or that I see people do a lot where I'm like, oh, that's not the way to go about that. Um, so maybe we'll start with some of those. What uh, what comes to mind in terms of ways not to go about building a relationship with brand? Well, I think the important question to answer, and this kind of directs us because I think we both feel similarly, is what's your goal or what's your outcome from it? And yeah. I think that if you're younger or newer in the space, people think of it as just this quick way to like get free things. Yeah. And when you think of it that way and it's very transactional and it's almost like a one-time thing and you're not trying to foster a relationship, everybody immediately goes to like, oh, I should DM this brand. Because most brands within the space, if you reach out to them and ask for something, they're willing to send you product once for free or with a good discount. But at the end of that, it, you're left with like a very shallow relationship. You're left without the opportunity to continue to grow anything. And so I think that it's like a quick dopamine hit that you that you receive something that turns into nothing after the fact and you realize that you didn't really build anything from it. And so yeah. I think that's my big don't do is unless you truly don't care about what happens after the fact, I think that go, just blindly DMing a brand or reaching out to a brand without any relationship behind it is probably the worst thing that you could do because you've just become this transactional thing on their Instagram. Totally. Yeah, I think with that, uh, a lot of people seem to go into it with just this idea of getting as many free things as possible. And I, I will often see people tag, you know, seven competing training camps in their, in their story, right? Or they post yeah. like, you know, every belt company or every drink company. It's like, or maybe throughout a week, they're tagging, you know, one coffee company. And then later in the week, they're tagging another coffee company. And they're kind of acting like a fan of each brand, either all at the same time, <laughs> or constantly. And I just, not only does it look kind of tacky, but it's also just not really effective in building mm -hmm. a relationship. I would find brands that you do truly resonate with and really like their mission and their product and be a true fan of them before you even ask for anything. You know, that's how uh, my relationship with Podium started. I imagine yours was probably pretty similar. Um, you know, I was using their stuff and posting about it and and telling friends about it because I liked it before I even mm -hmm. knew that any kind of relationship would be possible. And that's how a lot of the, the brands that I work with um, have come about. And so I think picking one in a category that you do genuinely like and committing to supporting that brand before you ever seek anything is a, is a good place to start. Yeah, 100%. I think it either be engaging regularly with the brand, which I promise you might not think that there's somebody behind the social media channel, but there is and they know the people that are constantly uh, interacting with the brand. As someone who uh, runs a social media yes. channel, I can definitely attest to that. Uh, or just regularly engaging with an individual that's a part of that group. And that can yeah. be, that's kind of how my relationship with Podium started is I had built a relationship with Shay. And when she was starting to build up their ambassador program and do more with it, she then approached me because she knew me already. She had a relationship with me. She knew what I was doing in the space. She knew that I could be somebody that she felt like was a good reflection of what she was trying to build. And that makes it easier. And so yeah. whether that's directly through the brand or through the people who are influential with the brand, it's pretty much the same thing, but it all boils down to relationships. And I think that brands very quickly start to learn just like, you know, celebrities do when they get popular, you learn who's there for you because of you and who's there for you because of what you can offer them. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, and thinking about building that relationship, you know, yeah, it's like you could reach out and ask for stuff, but it should be a mutual, you know, uh, like they're getting something, you're getting something. Mm -hmm. And I don't think exchanging for a post or something like that is like that to me, that just feels kind of gross. Mm -hmm. It's like, what are you actually offering the brand in, in exchange for something. And you don't often know what that can be until you develop a little bit more of an intimate relationship with them. So just mm -hmm. reaching out and being like, I'll post about your belt. It's like a lot of people will post about their belt. Like, why is that valuable to them? You know? Um, so it's waiting until you do meet them at a competition or learn more about their brand values and say, Hey, I'm a, 
um, you know, I love working in video. Like I can make a really cool, whatever, right. Like with your mm -hmm. belt or, um, I have a lot of friends at the gym that are looking for one, like here, X, Y, Z, you know? Um, but it's not just, Hey, I, I'll wear it or, Hey, I'll post about it because they don't really need you to do that. A lot of people will do that without them sending free stuff. Right. Yeah. And I think that even like your friends and your followers, the people who this brand is expecting you're able to sell to for them, they go through this cycle with you as well. Because I know that like yeah. Podium specifically, like when I first started working with Podium, the first time I post about it, people's responses are always like, do you actually like it? Or are they totally. just sending it to you? And now that it's been, I don't even know, it's been well over a year, maybe, maybe closer to two years. Um, now the questions are like, hey, which is your favorite flavor of this? Or hey, yeah. like, is there something new coming out or should I buy this one right now? And so because there's been this long drawn out relationship that I haven't really pushed down people's throats. I don't really push the code very often. I post about the product when it's sitting in front of me or there's a reason for it. Now people are like, oh, like I want to come to you to ask about this because you're somebody that I've constantly seen doing this thing. And now I have trust in you for what you think about it. Totally. Yeah. Ad adding value to your friends or audience, right? Of like, here's what I use and why I like it before you mm -hmm. ever try to sell it necessarily. Yeah. That's yeah. a really good point. I think, um, you know, we've talked a lot about like if people get the opportunity to go to competitions, like all the value that there is in that and in community and all kinds of things. And I think another one is getting to meet brands. I think a lot of the, yeah. the relationships that I have um, have been from at competitions, whether they're larger ones like Waterpalooza or the games or smaller ones like Zalos games or what have you, like going around and meeting vendors, especially ones that I already knew that I was interested in the brand. Um, that's how I developed my relationship with Paper Street more mm -hmm. recently is uh, Roderick, who was on our podcast recently. I interviewed him at Wadapalooza and he had mentioned the story that he also told on the podcast about how uh, the owner of Paper Street, Gabe, helped him get to Wadapalooza. And so he told me that at Wadapalooza. And then I was like, how cool. Like, what a great yeah. guy. Like, that's really neat. So then I went to the Paper Street booth and like met Gabe. And I was like, dude, what does Paper Street mean? Like, where, like, how long have you been doing this? And, and purely just from a place of curiosity, right? But showing that interest, I think, and and truly caring about like, wow, you're a good person who's now helped friends of mine. Like, tell me more about this business that you're building, yeah. I think is a great way to start building a relationship so that next time you go to a competition, you're like, oh my gosh, so good to see you again, right? Like before you ever ask for anything, before anything's ever offered, you're truly just getting to know someone on a human level that happens to run a business in the industry that you're interested in. And then you can see where it goes from there. Right. For sure. And uh, I think it's just more fulfilling that way. Like you feel better about it. I don't know. Yeah. Not everybody feels this way maybe, but like I've had brands reach out to me or they've reached out to Cairo or whatever. And they've just said, Hey, like we want to send you a product. I'm like, okay. Um, I've never tried it before. Uh, do you, do you need anything from me as far as post? Because I'm not really comfortable doing this. They're like, no, we just want to send it. And they send it and I'm less likely to use it. And I never post about it because there's just nothing in it. There, not that there's nothing in it for me. I have no investment in it because it's not something that I sought out that I was interested in. Right. And I think on the flip side is like when I've met a person or a brand at an event or in lot or in a live competition or one of my close friends has been using it and I've had the opportunity to try it. I'm just so much more excited to talk about it. Yeah. Like, uh, like I've been a huge fan of strike movement shoes forever before they yeah. even made the haze trainer when it was just the chill pill shoes years ago, I used to wear them and it was one of my favorite things when they came out with their CrossFit shoe. Finally, I was super excited about them. I then had the opportunity to meet those guys at Wadapalooza and they were such cool dudes. It's such a small brand. There's just a few of them. They're based out of Canada, but they told me more about like their plans and what they're trying to build with it and how they kind of do things a little bit differently. And now it's like, I don't, like I, there's no question when, that when something comes out from that brand that I want to buy it uh, and I'm happy to post about it to the point where people are like, oh, like, how'd you get hooked up with Strike Movement? I'm like, I'm not hooked up with Strike Movement. I just really yeah. like this brand and that's why I talk about it. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a big thing is just like being a true fan and, and feeling authentically aligned with them mm -hmm. and their products and then letting that grow instead of seeking the end goal right from the beginning. You know, I think um, it's it's natural to think like if you're someone who loves CrossFit, right? Like how can I make money doing this? How mm -hmm. can I get free things doing this? But it's really, if you think about like <laughs> your, your uh, experience in a CrossFit gym too, right? It's really about the relationships. Yeah. And then everything else is just a really cool byproduct of that. So if you go take it from that approach too, it's like, how can you build relationships with people that also 
probably love CrossFit and like share similar values, right? Because they're in your industry. And then if they happen to make really cool products, then it's just a cool byproduct of that. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, there's basically to me like three key outcomes of what you could get from a brand relationship. There is product, right? Or whatever they, their service or product that they offer. There is financial gain, uh, potentially for people. And then there's opportunity essentially. And like Roderick's a good example of that where he wasn't necessarily getting paid by anything, but he was having opportunities to go to events and do the things he loved because this brand had this relationship with him because Gabe believed in him and what he was trying to do. Um, there were a couple of brands that supported one of my teams that I had competing at semifinals that had no intention of making the CrossFit games, but they found a couple local brands or brands that wanted to support them and they helped kind of make that happen. And the conversation I had with one of my athletes from that team after the fact was, this is actually just this week. So it's a couple weeks after semis. I, I said to him, I was like, Hey, have you talked to such and such such the event? Meaning like any of the people from those brands? And he's like, no, I haven't. Why? And I said, because they did you a huge favor helping out at this event. Yeah. And you continuing to foster this relationship over time and just checking in with them and acting like a real person is going to be pay off tenfold when it comes to next season and you need help again. Because oh. people are willing to help you once, but they're not going to help you twice if they don't feel like there was anything mutual out of it and they feel like they were just used by you. Yeah. I think, gosh, that's such a good point. You can't almost go far enough in just being like as gracious as possible. Like mm -hmm. if you feel like you had a good experience somewhere, like tell them. If you feel like someone helped you, tell them. Like it can be the smallest thing. And I just think that that goes so far, especially with some of these larger brands that have more money to spend or have more interactions, you know, you're going to stand out when you follow up with a text or an email that are like, you know, not asking for anything. Like I'm just sincerely expressing my gratitude and yeah. then move on. And it takes you two seconds and it's like, man, that goes so far. Mm -hmm. I think, you know? I, th I think the challenge for people is that there's this, this like keeping up with the Joneses game where yeah. you see people and you're like, dang, X person has like three or four sponsors or dang, this person gets all this product from this company. And I think that a couple of things about it are one, you see the outcome. You don't see the process of them getting to there. Like you don't see the fact that they were building these relationships for two or three years, maybe, or you don't see that this person has a massive influence on whatever their subgroup is. And so they're, they're a productive partner for this company. But two, I think that, uh, uh I totally lost my train of thought on it, but I, <laughs> I, I think that it puts you in this race of feeling like you need more and you need all of these things. And then you, you get these people with three very shallow ambassadorships and they're pushing codes all of the time. And instead of building relationships and strengthening relationships, it's, I think it's weakening them for, for you. And it's yeah. putting you in a position where sure you might be getting product from three different companies, but you're just pushing a code that people are a little tired of seeing and you're less productive with that than you would be with one strong relationship that you allowed to take two to three years to build. Totally. Well, and it's such a small, relatively industry. You know, you probably don't know every <clears throat> brand that uh, LeBron James works with, right? Like if you tried to name them all, you probably couldn't unless you're like a super fan. Um, and it's like, you just don't have the same connection to that, but you probably do know like what belt sponsors your favorite CrossFit athlete. Yeah. Or like you probably do know what supplements they they post That's about, true. right? Because it, it's just so much closer and it's, it's you know, just a little bit more of an intimate relationship that we have with athletes, which is super cool. Um, but then again, like if you're constantly switching brands or like constantly promoting different ones, it just people notice, whereas people yeah. probably don't notice when like really big name athletes switch brands unless it's, right. you know, something super noteworthy. But um, I just, I think it's like, yeah, like really letting it marinate and investing in a couple really good ones versus like, how can I accumulate as many things as possible? Mm -hmm. Gosh, people know, people take note of that, you know? For sure. Yeah. And, and we're, there's definitely levels to the, uh, the, I don't know what you want to call it, partnership, sponsorship, affiliation game, right? Like when you're LeBron or when you're a CrossFit athlete with a million followers, the, the level of the deals are much yeah. different. And the opportunities are different. And so, yeah, you might see people make pretty drastic jumps that you'd be like, oh, are you truly aligned with this brand? But they're making a significant living off of those things. And I think sure. that there's different reasons and opportunities for that. We're speaking more to like people like us, people that are yeah. aspiring to become a part of different things. Um, yeah, like you're, everybody knows probably the brands that we are closely associated with, even without us having larger 
followings or speaking that much about it because they're like genuinely things that we're a part of. Most yeah. people know exactly the brands that Kyra is a part of because it's she's within the space because it's a really small bubble that we have and because those are genuine connections. And so, so I think that, you know, we've kind of beat it into the ground, but I just think it's such a relationship based space because that's already what the CrossFit community is like. And so you can't really get around the fact that you have to engage with the companies, engage with the people behind it in order to put yourself in a position to, to have some positive gain from it. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I want to follow up on one thing you said earlier too, was that it, you know, there's like three major outcomes that can happen. One of them being opportunities. And we've done a podcast on like how to work in this space because yeah. that's a really natural thing that people want to do. And that's so true too. I mean, it's, I've seen time and time again where, you know, people become, build a relationship with a brand and then that brand needs help at an event or yeah. like needs something where then you can like make money contributing or like get a job. You know, that's truly a large part of how I got hired at HWPO is for the last couple of years I have made, I was at their first activation they ever did in at the 2021 CrossFit games, 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they were like, Hey, we're leading a workout. And I was like, wow, I've been like reading the books and following like you, you know, the stuff you guys put out, like, I want to be at that workout and introduced myself and have gone to like every time they do an activation an event, I go. And at Wadapalooza, Lauren and I, when we were working at morning chalk up, stayed up like really late every night working. But there was one night where we were planning to go to an HWPO workout the next morning. And we were up until like five in the morning working. And we were like, Oh, we probably shouldn't go to the work. Like we really should sleep <clears throat> so we can be productive today and not go to this workout. And I literally said like, gosh, I always go see them at events and like make sure I go to their activations and support them. We should really go. Like we're going to be tired, but we should go. And we went and I ended up meeting Harry who runs operations and Aaron who works in operations and some employees that I hadn't met before. And then after Wadapalooza is when I ended up interviewing with them. And it's like yeah. now I had already met them, but I hadn't met them before. And that's a very concrete example, but it's like being committed to showing up for them, I think goes a long way in both free things like we've talked about, but also opportunities to get a job, to make a connection, to, you know, do things like that as well. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think it's, it is the quickest way to find your way in the sport without needing to know exactly what your direction is. Like, yeah. I think about somebody like Chad as well, who produces our yeah. podcast and helps create all the graphics and everything for us. Chad has been hustling to get involved in every way that he can. And I don't even know if he has a direct aim or an outcome for him, but he helped create the website for Brian Friend. He's done apparel for a dozen different brands in the space. Like if you go to his social media, you can see a lot of the brands he's worked with and he's doing incredible stuff. And just by putting himself out there, I'm now seeing him at more and more events as well. And I'm certain that there are people that are asking or offering or helping him get there in some way because of the work that he's doing for them. And that's going to lead him to whatever exciting outcome he wants just because he's willing to put in the work for it. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, shout out to Chad. Like I have a friend that's in the industry that's starting a podcast that I'm actually meeting with later today. And uh, I asked Chad, I was like, Hey, are you taking on new clients? Like this would be a great yeah. fit for you. Right. And he's never asked us to refer him, but like we've experienced his hard work and consistency and reliability. And so it just makes sense for you to be like, Oh, you should work with this guy. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it's the referrals and the connections just by showing up and doing a good job. Mm -hmm. For sure. Love it. Shout out Chad. Shout out Chad. Um, he does the good work. I know. <laughs> Anything else on this that you want to mention before we tie the bow on it? I don't think so. I think, uh, I think that was really like the main message that I wanted to get across for it. It's a good reflection for us. A uh, good opportunity to uh, maybe subliminally be very grateful for the companies that have helped support us along the way. Totally. Shout out to Podium for sponsoring this podcast. We love you guys. Definitely shout out to Podium. Mostly Shay. It. Mostly Shay. And Paul. <laughs> and Trey. Everyone that works and there. Jared. Everybody. Work there. <laughs> love it. Awesome. Thanks, friends. If you guys enjoyed this episode or feel like it could benefit somebody, maybe you have a, a serial brand poster in your gym, maybe maybe slide this one in their DMs, right? Be like, hey, I have some tips for you. Uh, but uh, if you enjoyed it, leave a comment, review, send it to a friend, all of the good things. And then we will catch you guys next week on the Gym Class Heroes podcast. You said a uh, serial brand poster, and I immediately thought about a Wheaties poster on the wall <laughs> in the gym, and I didn't really understand what you meant. Now I get it, but my version was better. And your goodbye. Version. Your version is better.